Hello there. Thanks again for stopping by to watch this week's Sunday School lesson. Our lesson this week, it is the sixth lesson of the quarter, and we are taking a look at forgiveness today. We're taking a look at the blessing of forgiveness and new life, new life, which is again found through forgiveness. Our lesson this week, again, focusing in on forgiveness, we are going to learn the blessing that we have in finding mercy in God's eyes. We are also today going to learn what is proper forgiveness. We're going to learn what is proper in seeking forgiveness. We are going to learn today what is proper in forgiving someone who has wronged us. I believe that a lot of us have a misunderstanding of proper forgiveness and we go about forgiving those who have wronged us. A lot of times we go about it in the wrong manner. So we are going to learn today the proper way to forgive someone. We are going to learn today the proper way in seeking forgiveness, because again, none of us are perfect. Uh, and there are often times where we have to go and seek forgiveness from someone. All right. So let's go ahead and jump into our Sunday school lesson this week. We're going to start off by looking at the first through the fourth verse here in our lesson this week. And we'll see here in the first through the fourth verse, that John, and this is John the disciple, by the way, he is speaking about Christ here. We'll see the phrase there, the word of life. Let us remember again that Jesus is the word. As John said in his gospel, in the first chapter of his gospel, in the first verse, said in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And the word John said was made flesh and the word dwelt among the people. So again, what John is explaining here to his readers, he's explaining that he was one who was a literal witness of Christ. John talks about how he was able to hold on to Christ. He talks about how he was able to touch Christ, how he saw Christ with his own eyes. So as a disciple, again, let us remember that John was very close to Jesus in his gospel. Uh, we will often see that John, he referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He never mentions his name. But again, throughout his gospel, when you see and read uh, John's gospel, you'll often see the disciple whom Jesus loved. That is John speaking of himself. Jesus truly did love John. He loved all of his disciples, but John was very close to Jesus. So the question that we can come away with here from the first through the fourth verse is, why was John speaking about his witness of Christ here? Why do you think John was speaking about his witness of Christ here? Well, there are a few reasons. Uh, the first reason that I would point out to you is that John wanted his readers to understand that he was not making up anything that he wrote about here in this letter. John wanted his readers to know that he was not a secondhand witness of Christ. John wanted his readers to know and understand that he saw Jesus, that he heard Jesus firsthand account that was very important in that day because there were a lot of false witnesses of Christ going around at that day, uh, speaking of him, writing of him as well. John, he wanted his readers to know that he was not one of those people. He truly was uh, the disciple of Jesus. He truly did witness Jesus with his own eyes. He heard Jesus with his own ears as well. Again, we have to remember, just as we discussed in our Sunday school lesson last week with Paul, John is trying to encourage his readers to come to Christ, to come to the Lord. He's trying to persuade his readers to repent. He was calling for them to turn away from their wicked ways. He was calling for them to turn away from sin and to turn to living in the way of God, following God's instructions. That was the goal of John, to again, encourage and to persuade others that were around him who hadn't done so already to repent. And again, that's the same message that, that we as ministers of the good news. And when I say ministers and I say we there, I'm talking about not just the preachers, but I'm talking about all believers uh, we have, again, a ministry of reconciliation, as we saw in our Sunday school lesson last week. And we should be calling on others to repent from their wicked ways if they have not done so already. John, he again, he desired, we'll see there in the first through the fourth verse, 
He desired for those that were around him to live in fellowship with not only him and those who are also of the faith, but to live in fellowship with the Lord. It is so we, we should not underestimate. And I believe that this happens. We should not underestimate living in fellowship, dwelling and being in fellowship with the Lord. That close personal relationship with God is, again, something that should not be taken for granted. That in itself truly is a blessing. And again, we saw that ministry of reconciliation last week. Here today, we'll see that in our close relationship with the Lord, the door is always open. The door is always open because of his forgiveness and for his mercy as well. Again, he wanted John, he wanted his readers here from what we see here in the first of the fourth verse, right there in that fourth verse, he wanted his readers to experience true joy. He wanted their joy to be full. Again, as I said in our Sunday school lesson last week, we can find happiness in the world. We can find blessings from living in this world that are of the world. We can, somebody out of the world can bless us. But that blessing is drastically different from a blessing that comes from God. Blessings that are of the world, they are temporary. They are seasonal. They come and they go. They fade away over time. Whereas a blessing, a gift that comes from God, it does not fade away. It is always with us. And that happiness, that joy that God brings, it does not fade away. It again, it is always with us. Okay. All right. With that in mind, let us go ahead and take a look here at the fifth through the eighth verse here. And here in the fifth through the eighth verse, we'll see that John, he is calling our attention to the idea there. We just mentioned being in fellowship. He's bringing it up here. He's calling our attention to the idea of being in fellowship with Christ. Yet we'll notice here that he says here that there were some who were going around and proclaiming that they were in fellowship with Christ, yet they were still walking in darkness. Now, how could that possibly make sense? Now, let us understand darkness here. Walking in darkness means to be walking in the way of sin. It means to be walking in the way of wickedness, sin, wickedness. It is everything that is in opposition to the way of God. It is disobedience to God's instructions. That is what sin, that is what wickedness truly is. Now, we know that this happened to be the case because, again, John, he clearly states here, we'll see that God is light. And he says here also that in God, there is no darkness. So what this means here is that If one is walking in the way of God, that person, we as believers, right? We should always be walking in his light. There should be no darkness coming from within us at all. Because again, as I said in our Sunday school lesson last week, the Holy Spirit dwells in all the hearts of those that genuinely believe. And the Holy Spirit is God. God is light. So there should be no darkness in our soul, because again, the Holy Spirit is working that transformative work that is transforming us into a new creation, a new creature. And again, old man and his wicked ways, his sins should be far behind us. Let us remember again what Christ proclaimed himself. Christ, he proclaimed himself to be the light of the world. And Jesus, he said that anyone who follows him, they will not walk in darkness. So if you genuinely believe, if you are of true faith in Christ, you should not be walking in sin. You should not be walking in wickedness. Sin should not be your way. Your way should be the way of righteousness. Your way should be the way of Christ. Now, something that may have been happening again at that time, and I believe that this is definitely uh, what is being told to us, is that there were some who were saying that they were in fellowship with the Lord, but their speech and their actions, they said otherwise. You see, there are many still living today in our world who proclaim that they are believers, who proclaim that they are a child of God. And yet they, in their speech, 
and in their actions, it says otherwise. There are, again, many living today who proclaim the same thing as those who were living in John's day. And they think of themselves very highly. They think of themselves as being without sin. They think of themselves as being perfect. I tell you today that there is no man, there is no woman, there is no boy or girl. No matter how much we may love them, there is nobody that is perfect. You see, the truth of the matter is what Jesus came to the world and expressed to us. The truth of the matter is that all of us have sinned. And as Paul said, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. So in the fact that all of us are sinners, we needed Christ. We needed the love of God to come to the world to tell us exactly that. We live with sin. Yet there's again another truth there that that Christ shared with us as well. That even though we live in sin, even though we are sinners in God's eyes, we can be forgiven of our sins. So we can again, we can find mercy in God's eyes. Uh, We can find forgiveness in God's eyes. Most importantly, we can find salvation in God's eyes. And that is the blessing of forgiveness. That is the blessing of new life. That when we go to the Lord and we seek for his forgiveness, God is willing and ready to forgive us of our sins, our trespasses, our disobedience against him. And he's willing to to give us the blessing of salvation, to be able to overcome our disobedience, to be able to overcome our trespasses against him, our wrongdoings, our sin. God gives us the opportunity to, to overcome so that we can one day be with him eternally in his heavenly kingdom. That again, I tell you, that truly is a wonderful blessing. And I tell you today that we should not take that blessing for granted. Now, I believe the sad thing that often happens when it comes to the idea of thinking that we are perfect, again, just taking a look here at the six and the eight verse, is the fact that when we proclaim to be perfect, when we proclaim to have never sinned or that we are without sin, we are making the gospel. And not only, again, are we making the gospel, we are making the Lord out to be a liar. Again, God loved the world and he gave the world his only begotten son to come and tell us to repent. That was the message of Christ. Repentance, turning away from our wickedness so that we can find salvation and, again, mercy in God's eyes so that we can experience true happiness, so that we can experience true joy. That's what the Lord desires for us. I've I've talked about the eternal desires of the Lord. He wants us to be happy. And he knows how to, to make us happy. But again, we can't find happiness if we believe ourselves to be perfect, to be without sin. We can't find happiness if we are turning around and telling the Lord, that he himself is a liar. We must acknowledge that we aren't perfect. We we must acknowledge that we are with sin and we must be willing to go to the Lord. Just as we'll see here in this ninth verse, the ninth verse, it is the meat of our Sunday school lesson for this week. So let's dive into this ninth verse because here in the ninth verse, we're going to see what is proper for forgiveness. We are told here in the ninth verse, We're told that everyone, again, is a sinner, yet God, he is more than willing and ready to forgive anybody of their sins. But I want you to notice here that one must go to the Lord in order to be forgiven of their sins. One must go to the Lord and John says they must confess. We must confess our sins to the Lord. We must confess our disobedience, our trespasses, the wrong that we have done against God. We must confess these things to the Lord. Now, this is the part of forgiveness that I believe is often overlooked, but we cannot and we should not overlook this part of forgiveness. 
You see, this is what is proper for forgiveness. When one has wronged you or when you have wronged someone, we must go to that person that we have wronged and we must make confession of the wrong that we have done. We must we must acknowledge the wrong that we have done to them. Whoever has wronged us, they must come to us and they must acknowledge the what they have done wrong to us. You see, too often this part is skipped by a lot of people. They will forgive someone, even though that someone has never come to them and acknowledged that they have actually wronged them. That is not proper for forgiveness. And that's how a lot of people end up so messed up uh, is that they'll forgive someone and then they'll wonder, well, why that person is still acting the way that they are acting, even though, again, they have never confessed to us. Something else that that we should often should also, I should say, note about forgiveness here is that the one who has been wronged, they should rebuke the person that has wronged them. Okay. They, they, they should correct the person that has wronged them. If you, if you take a look at, at God, the example that he set when it came to forgiveness, when he gave the world, his only begotten son, he sent his son to rebuke us. God did not forgive mankind without the rebuke. And this often is what, again, happens today, is that there are many people who will forgive someone without even correcting them, without even rebuking them. Do not ever skip that step when it comes to forgiveness. We must be willing to offer the rebuke. We must be willing to correct someone. Again, how else can somebody know that they have wronged us if we never give them the rebuke, if we never correct them in the wrong that they have done? So, again, we must. I would say the first step is we must rebuke somebody. We must correct them. When someone has done us wrong, we should tell them. We should let them know, hey, you've done me wrong. The second step is then on the next person. The, 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 the second step is on the person that has actually wronged us. The second step is that they should acknowledge that they have done wrong. Admit they have done wrong. Confess that they have done wrong to us. Again, this is what the Lord desires out of us. He rebuked us, right? When he, when he, when he sent his only begotten son to the world, he rebuked us. And then he desires for us to come and to confess to him, to acknowledge that we have done wrong, that we have sinned against him. And then when we have made that confession, we are told here again by John that God is both faithful and for, and just to forgive us of our sins, our unrighteousness. So again, when we talk about proper forgiveness, when we have rebuked the one who has wronged us and they have repented, they have confessed, they have acknowledged that they have done wrong. The shoe then falls on, on our foot. It falls on us to then forgive that person. And again, Jesus said that as often as someone comes and they repent, they have, they acknowledge that they have wronged us. Jesus said that we should be willing to forgive them of the wrongs that they have done. That is the proper way that we go about seeking forgiveness. That is the proper way that we go about forgiving those who have wronged us. That is, again, something that I hope that you carry with you, that you take with you today. Forgiveness, and again, it involves a rebuke. Forgiveness, it then revol uh, involves a repentance. The person who has done the wrong, they must acknowledge, they must repent, they must confess that they have done the wrong. And then the one who has been wronged, must then move forward in forgiving the one who has wronged us. Okay. All right. At this point of our Sunday school lesson, we then dive into the, the closing section of our Sunday school lesson, which is in the second chapter of first John. Let's take a look at this and let's take a look here at the first through the fifth verse. And we'll see here again where John, he states the purpose as to why he was writing this letter. John, we'll see, he said here uh, that he desired that our joy be full. Again, in order for our joy to be full, John desired that his readers did not live in sin. He desired that his readers do not sin. Yet we should point out, we should note here, because again, like I said, there is nobody who is perfect. We are all going to sin, even we who are of genuine faith. OK, we do not live without error, but 
we do live with, as John explains here, we do live with an advocate. Should we sin, John has given us the directions to take so that we can be forgiven of our sins. And we'll see again that John, he speaks to how we have an advocate. We have a mediator. We have an intercessor in Christ who will stand and who will speak on our behalf. Okay. We have a go-between. We have a mediator who will say again, father, lay that charge on me. We have one who will speak up on our behalf, uh, the wrongs that we have done so that again, we can find forgiveness so that we can again, find mercy in the Lord's eyes. You see, and we may be genuine believers, but none of us, no man, no woman, no boy, no girl, none of us are perfect. We will still sin. We will still err in our way. But because of our faith, and this again is something that is of the utmost importance that all of us know, because of our faith, we have a mediator. We have an advocate and we have someone who's going to stand up for us who's going to speak good of us, even though we have done wrong, so that we can again find grace, so that we can again find mercy in God's eyes. Again, this is the blessing of forgiveness. When we are of genuine faith and we come to the Lord and we confess our sins to him, his grace, again, it is poured out onto us, his love, that is, in that God is willing to forgive us of the wrongs that we have done. Again, God is, is willing to have mercy on us. And I, I tell you, that to me, that should be a heavy weight lifted up off our shoulders. Because sin, and, and I believe I said this last week, either I said it in the video or I said it while I was teaching last week at church. Sin is a heavy weight to carry. And there are so many of us who try to, to carry that heavy load and we are unable to do it because eventually that load will get too heavy and it will crush us. It will burden us. It will press down us, daunt down on us, and it will destroy us. What we should do is we, all of us, we should cast all of that onto the Lord. And God, again, he wants to carry that load for you. He does not want you to be trying to bear that. So again, when we go to God and, and we get that forgiveness, it's like breathing in a fresh, breath of air. It is new life to us. Okay. All right. So that is our Sunday school lesson for this week. I hope that you enjoyed this lesson and I hope that you learned something and I hope that you will share this lesson with someone somewhere. And I hope that you'll come back for our Sunday school lesson next week. Next week, we get into the intercessor. We dive into that even more in our Sunday school lesson next week. Until that time again, let us continue to keep one another lifted up in prayer. You never know what anyone is going through. So certainly be prayerful. Let us also continue about in grace and in love. That is our calling as a child of God to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Now, if you want to go into more depth about this Sunday school lesson, head over to newfoundfaith.org. I have links in the description below for this week's Sunday school lesson to where you can read the commentary of this Sunday school lesson. And you can also listen to the full audio commentary of this Sunday school lesson on the website or at your favorite podcasting service as well. So until next time, again, I'll continue to keep all of you lifted up in my prayers. And I pray that God continues to keep and to bless all of you.